Um, so my segment is going to be really short, really, really short. Uh, and the, 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 the title here is what is the healthiest diet? Um, so I was getting into this a little bit because, um, I was doing a piece for mass about just kind of painting with broad strokes about nutrition. Like it, if you were just to give someone a really simple set of guidelines and say, you know what, this is going to broadly nudge you in the direction of a healthy eating pattern. Is this perfect? Have we fully solved human nutrition and optimized it for performance and longevity? Not quite. We're not there, you know, but we have learned a couple things. And I think it's important to, when possible, lean on the things that we have some decent evidence for, right? So um, I, I was putting together this piece about like, what are some of those guidelines that can broadly set us in the right direction with our eating patterns? Um, so that's one reason I wanted to talk about this. The other reason is I don't think it's happening more or changing all that much, but I feel like in recent months, I've been so much more aware of the arguments on social media of just like the wars between all these different popular diets and, and everyone's so focused on identifying the one and only optimal diet for the entirety of humanity uh, that is perfect in all ways, not just in some ways, but actually my way of dieting is best for your brain, your performance, your body comp, your long-term health, longevity, cardiometabolic health, even the environment, all of the things are best with my diet. Uh, and and when you see when you see people making those those same sets of claims for two diets that are literally mutually exclusive, you're like, what the hell is going on here, guys? Yeah. Um. And so it's it's harder than let, ever. Let me let me note up top as as both your friend and business partner, I am uh, both both delighted and terrified by this by this recent development of you becoming aware of these things because I remember. I remember back when we met and you were in grad school and we would talk about just like fitness industry stuff. You had a, a pretty good knowledge of everything that had been going on before you went to grad school. And then things that had happened within the last like four or five years, very murky. You're a bit busy guy in the lab all the time, barely on social media, not really monitoring the chatter. And now you've, you've been out of grad school enough and worked in a business that has to be on social media for, for things to function enough that over the last two or three years, you've, you've started to become sucked into the vortex of j just the, the dumbest and most ridiculous, but also most entertaining online arguments about inane shit related to health, nutrition, fitness. And, uh, I, I'm so excited for what, what the future holds as you continue to descend down those rabbit holes. Yeah, I mean, so like for context here, you know, my brain didn't fully come online, especially in the nutrition world, you know, until like the late 2000s, which would have put me in my late teens, basically. Um, I think that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, all the stuff that was going on in the 70s and 80s, perhaps it was as vitriolic and just flatly insane as it is today i doubt it um but but yeah then so i was kind of tapped in in the like late 2000s early 2010s then i went to grad school and everything happening in the outside world was just silenced i was just kind of stuck in the lab uh physically and mentally and yeah i i've emerged and i'm just like what in the world's going on and i will admit i've been clicking on more things lately yeah and so now all of the algorithm focused social media sites are like, oh, you like really dumb claims about nutrition. J guess what? I have a million of them and, yeah. and they're just flooding into my feed. So I, I do think, I, like I said, over the last couple months, but it's really been over the last few years. But over the last couple months, I've been clicking stuff. Yeah. And, and I'm really seeing the full weight of <laughs> algorithmic social media uh, and news feed stuff. It's good stuff. Man. Yeah. My news feeds and timelines and all that stuff are just getting insane. Like I'm losing touch with reality from some of the stuff I'm seeing. Uh, it, it's just a, a, a dazzling array of just insane claims and, and exaggerations and just flat out <laughs> misinformation uh about nutrition so anyway uh 
you know, like I, I feel like back in the day, it wasn't quite like this where there was like some general agreement on, you know, broadly speaking, what a decent diet looked like. Yeah. And then there, there yeah. were, you know, they're of course quibbling over the details and then maybe uh, following some lines of research that eventually fell flat, you know, for a minute there, everyone's like, oh, this, this margarine stuff seems pretty great. We can make these, these trans fatty acids. That seems like a good idea. And then eventually they're like, ah, yeah, about the trans fatty acids, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. You know, so um, anyway, these days things have gotten wild. And, and one of the things that um, really jumps out to me is that science is incremental and it's slow. It's slow and it's incremental. Every now and then you'll have a paradigm shift that will really fundamentally change the trajectory of that boring, slow kind of incremental progress. But in the nutrition space right now, everyone is fully committed, it seems, to just imploding the paradigm. Like, I, I can't tell you the number of pitches for a fringe diet that they, they all start with. Okay, first of all, forget everything you thought you knew about nutrition. And it's like, but I don't want to. Like, like yeah. I don't think it's a good idea for that to be the starting point for all nutritional discourse is forget everything you believe you th you know. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you fully subscribe to the current scientific consensus, really on any topic, but like nutrition included, uh, you will probably take on... 5% incorrect beliefs just because, yeah, science doesn't know everything yet. Uh, things are provisional. Um, and yeah, like the, the history of science suggests that we've been wrong about plenty of things before. And I'm sure we're, we're wrong about plenty of things right now. But what percentage of our current scientific understanding of nutrition is wrong? I feel like it's a number less than 100%. So someone yeah. saying throw out everything... There are a lot of babies being tossed out with that bathwater. Yeah, it, it kind of feels like if you were slowly and methodically over about eight decades working your way toward the center of a maze, and then uh, on a whim you just said, can you take me back to the start? I, I just want to start fresh and see what happens, yeah, right? And yeah. it's like, you can look at it from above and be like, dude, you were pretty close. <laughs> like you were really, you were really getting there yeah. before you said, hey, on a whim, I'll start over and, and try my luck with a different path. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's this knee jerk reaction of just forget everything that people have, forget all the knowledge that has, has been obtained over the last hundred years. And let's just like go on vibes or, you know, strained theories and, Dude, I was telling you off air, I saw a thing, you know, people look at these univariate correlations and say, okay, let's forget everything else in the world exists and only look at two variables, right? And, you know, you'll see this all the time. You'll say, well, we'll look at saturated fat increase has, uh, intake has increased since the 80s and look at this cardiometabolic out or obesity rates, you know, mm, it looks like they're both going up at the same time. Not good. Or, you know, hey, look at sugar intake over the last 30 years and obesity rates. Looks like they're both going up. Dude, I saw one the other day <laughs> that was looking at, you know, again, with a univariate correlation like this, it's basically saying, okay, let's just assume everything else is equal. No other major confounders that we really have to worry about here. Uh, pretty smooth sailing, but we'll just look at these two variables, some nutritional variable and obesity rates. The x-axis started in the 17... I think it started at the year 1700, and it was looking at sugar intake in the UK. Love that. And, and like you were saying off air, it's like, if you're going to look at a temporal correlation with obesity, just like any instance of industrialization is going to correlate with obesity over that time scale. Yeah. Like, like virtually anything. Like, so yeah, th there's just so many... Uh, insanely off track posts that you can run into that's kind of why i wanted to do a little segment on like so what if we didn't forget everything we know and instead just kind of made a short list of the things that we feel pretty good about knowing mm -hmm. so that's really the direction here so you know there's all these diets to pick from and people that will defend them to the death uh you know high carb high fat carnivore vegan mediterranean the list goes on and on and on. There's, there's these diets that people want to fight over. 
And always the question underlying those, those conversations is, what is the best diet? And I feel very strongly that that is the wrong question to be asking. I would throw that question out entirely and I would start from a different perspective. And that is, first of all, what are the, the major health issues that appear to be uh, quite meaningfully impacted by dietary habits? You know, what are the most pressing health issues that seem to be very closely linked to dietary habits and behaviors? And, and to me, some of the ones that really come up are obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and cancer. Those are some of the things that come to mind for me. And so then the second question you ask yourself, instead of what is the best diet for all things, you kind of key in on those if we're focused on health, right? So we'll kind of put performance and stuff aside. So we've got this kind of cluster of, uh, you know, pathologies or characteristics or whatever, these things that seem to be correlated with uh, negative cardiometabolic health outcomes or just generally, you know, mortality rates and other health outcomes. We've got this set of things we're focused on. Instead of asking what is the best diet for all things, what kind of dietary patterns, patterns, not diets, seem to reduce or elevate risks for these independent outcomes, right? And so when we look at, for example, obesity rates, you know, and we say, well, what kind of dietary factors or patterns seem to be uh, important to consider here? You might look at a diet and say, okay, well, what kind of energy density are we talking about? Uh, in what way is this diet uh, supporting satiety, you know, satiety and hunger regulation? Uh, what, how many hyper palatable foods are finding their way into this diet? What we're looking at is dietary patterns that generally promote uh, the overconsumption of total energy. You know, so the, the term you'll see in the literature sometimes is overnutrition. Just what kind of things within a dietary pattern nudge us toward overconsumption? And a lot of times it does come back to those factors, energy density, satiety regulation, and hyperpalatability. Uh, with diabetes, that was one of the ones I mentioned. Um, you know, uh, of course, overnutrition or overconsumption of energy is certainly a factor. So we would lean on those previous factors I, I mentioned there, those previous uh, broad dietary patterns. Um, and other things that come up, though, with diabetes is we might specifically look at to what extent are we kind of acutely overloading the liver with uh, excess energy substrates, not acutely it, like meal to meal, day to day, but are we having extended periods of time where we are coupling over nutrition with over consumption of maybe some key nutrients that really promote uh, the accretion of fat within the liver itself? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people underappreciate the role that the liver plays when it comes to glucose homeostasis, but uh, the, glu uh, the liver uh, influences many, many different pathways that are very critical in glycemic control. Yeah. And so if you're overfeeding and you have low physical activity, those two things alone are the key drivers. And I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, but you might also take it a step further and say, well, aside from those two main drivers, we might also be a little bit wary about dietary patterns that promote really high intakes of specific nutrients that uh, disproportionately facilitate fat accretion in the liver. And the two that come to mind would be saturated fat and fructose. That doesn't mean that you need to restrict both of those to the greatest extent possible. But what it means is, you know, if we want to limit risk for type 2 diabetes, we want to avoid overnutrition and low physical activity. Those are by far the most important drivers. But we can also look at some individual, like, if you're really going heavy on the saturated fat and the fructose, especially from added sugars, in combination with overnutrition and low activity, those are the types of patterns that we might want to keep our eye on. Yeah. Uh, with hypertension, broadly, in many cases, we're going to be looking at sodium, potassium, and, and some key phytonutrients that can affect vascular and endothelial function. Uh, heart disease... You know, we might be looking at specific fatty acid intakes, uh, added sugar intake, fiber intake. Uh, and then with cancer, we're looking in, in many cases at uh, intake of fiber, certain phytonutrients that, that might uh, decrease cancer risk. And then, of course, carcinogenic compounds that find their way directly into the diet, things that 
that seem to have pretty direct links to uh, the promotion of cancer formation. So, uh, of course, these are hard to separate entirely, you know, because a lot of these fall under the umbrella of metabolic syndrome. And so overnutrition and low activity is kind of broadly influencing essentially all of these outcomes. But we can start to look into little kind of individual nuances for each outcome. And again, kind of ask ourselves, not just the name of a diet that works here, uh, but but broadly speaking, what kind of dietary guidelines and patterns might we be nudged toward if we were really focusing on minimizing risk here? And this probably sounds like it's going to be like a three-hour segment where we go a deep dive into each individual um, outcome. But instead, I want to lean on a couple sets of guidelines that I've uh, been looking over lately that I think provide a pretty sensible starting point. Now, the huge caveat that's going to carry a lot of weight here. Uh, I'm going to go over these guidelines. There's two different tables that have a, a high degree of overlap. I'm not saying that any diet that deviates from one of these guidelines is a seriously and severely flawed diet. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm not saying that when we put these together, we have the perfect human diet. Frankly, I've given up on the idea of a singular perfect human diet. Humans are pretty flexible, pretty adaptable. That's why we're still here uh, throughout all of the famines in our evolutionary history. Uh, we can adapt to a lot and live on a lot of different diets. Um, so, you know, sometimes you'll you'll hear people say, oh, well, you know, this isn't technically an essential nutrient, therefore you should never eat it. And if you do eat it, it's bad for you. That That's silly. You know, yeah. humans, there are some essential nutrients we need, uh, but to discredit a dietary pattern because it, in, it includes like carbohydrates that are not technically considered an essential nutrient it's nonsense. It, it truly doesn't make any sense. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here are some guidelines. I, I do think it's funny that that same, same logic, like if, if that's what you're saying, like if something isn't necessary, you don't need to consume it at all. I've never seen someone apply that same logic to non-essential amino acids. Yeah. But like, why shouldn't it apply? You know? Yeah. No, it, it it's... um. It's a convenient way to discredit a dietary pattern that includes something that yours does not. Yeah, it's it's the type of thing where if you throw it out to an audience that doesn't really have their guard their guards up, it sound it sounds really uh, insightful and impressive until you think about it for three seconds. Yeah, and then hopefully you have continued talking enough that people won't think about it for three seconds because they're thinking about the next thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what I'm going to talk about here is uh, a, a couple sets of dietary guidelines that, again, it's, it's kind of a la carte, you know, cafeteria style. When I'm putting together a dietary pattern and, and establishing eating behaviors and habits, what I want to try to do is check some of these boxes off. So this is not a concise list that leads you toward a particular named diet. This is just things that like, ah, it would be nice if your diet checks a lot of these boxes or, it, you know, we shouldn't really treat them as dichotomous either. So if, for example, you're supposed to get 400 grams a day of something and it's like, okay, well, I, I usually get about 320. Well, that's better than 100, right? So it's about, th these are some guidelines to shoot for. You want to get close to them if you can, uh, and ideally get close to many of them, you know, and, and check off as many of these boxes as you can. So table number one that I'm looking at here, I'll put it on the screen. These are the healthy diet indicator criteria uh, from the World Health Organization. Uh, and I know uh, some people, the, the World Health Organization isn't necessarily your direct pathway to make people say, okay, now I can let my guard down. I, I know a lot of people have said a lot of things about the, the WHO in recent years. Uh, their Q rating, I guess, isn't as high as it used to be. Uh, a Q rating is like a term that they'll use in like uh, various places. Like, how do people generally view you? Like your general good vibes uh, to, to an audience. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, people have been uh, really critical of the World Health Organization and in some very specific pockets of the population i'd say yeah for uh i would say for a combination of of deserved and undeserved reasons and yeah. i 
don't want to elaborate beyond that. Yeah. So what I want to get at here is regardless of the organization, you don't want to just say, well, I'm going to turn off critical thinking. And just because any particular organization says something, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just going to blindly accept all of it. But in this case, uh, it, it's a set of criteria that is extremely compatible with the best available evidence in nutrition. It, it's a really rigorous set of criteria that I think uh, leads you toward uh, a really nice eating pattern. And for the record, I have I currently have a high level of trust for the World Health Organization. I, I think they're doing their best and generally doing a, a decent job. Uh, but anyway... Uh, table one here, uh, fruits and vegetables, you want to be aiming for over, uh, greater than or equal to 400 grams a day. Uh, total fat, you want to limit that to no more than 30% of total energy. Saturated fat, no more than 10% of total energy. Polyunsaturated fats, aiming for 6 to 11% of total energy. Uh, free sugar or like added sugars, less than 10% of total energy. Dietary fiber, at least 25 grams a day, and potassium at least 3,500 milligrams per day. Now, people are going to look at that uh, in a variety of different diet um, groups, you know, people who are kind of really strong p proponents of a particular diet. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some elements they love and some elements they hate. So, for example, if you're someone who's really, um, really adamant about ketogenic diets, you would look at total fat less than 30% of total energy. You're not going to like that. Mm -hmm. You're going to be pretty annoyed by that. But you might look at free, you know, added sugar less than 10% of total energy and say, well, yeah, that that makes sense. That's sensible. Um, so it's important to recognize, I'm not saying that like no one can be healthy on a ketogenic diet, right? But, but this is kind of a list of just painting with broad strokes. What general dietary patterns seem to be associated with really positive outcomes in terms of mortality and just broadly cardiometabolic health. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first table. The second table, that, that was from 2015. That was the, the set of criteria. Uh, looking at 2020, uh, there's a, an updated set of criteria. I can't really tell based on the paper if this is necessarily like from the World Health Organization or if it's just a research group who said, I we want to propose some 2020 updates to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, I, I do think it adds a couple little boxes to it that, that are that are pretty sensible. So um, the, the scoring for, for these three things is just greater than zero grams per day, mm -hmm. <laughs> which just means, hey, try to eat this stuff. Yeah, it, it's yeah. generally associated with some nice things. Uh, and and th those categories are beans and other legumes, uh, nuts and seeds, and whole grains. And broadly speaking, when you look at the observational literature and you combine it with randomized controlled trials, uh, dietary patterns that feature these uh, in you know relatively moderate to to high amounts seem to seem to do pretty well, right? So that's why the the uh, the recommendation is greater than zero grams. It's like try to build a diet that includes some of these things uh it recommends limiting limiting dietary sodium to less than two grams a day so less than 2,000 milligrams it recommends zero grams per day of processed meat which qualitatively speaking just means eh, probably don't eat processed meat if you do you know try to limit that to the extent you can and then for unprocessed meat it says less than 71, less than or equal to 71 grams a day. Very oddly specific number. Um, but but what they're generally getting at there is, hey, you know, there's there's other protein sources that are not necessary. Or no, I said, I said unprocessed meat. It should be unprocessed red meat. Yeah. So that, that's actually a big flub that I made there. So they're referring specifically to unprocessed red meat with that limit of less than or equal to 71 grams per day. So again, broadly speaking, what they're doing is looking at the literature in aggregate in its totality and saying, okay, these seem like generally good boxes to check when you're putting together a relatively healthy eating pattern. Um, and again, we don't want to approach this super dogmatically, right? So for example, with sodium, that's going to be one that gets people pretty riled up because right now there's a pretty big contingent, especially in the fitness space saying like, you know what your biggest problem is? You're not having enough sodium and you need to have salt like before your workouts and stuff. Um, 
And, and then there's another contingent that's kind of more from the conventional health literature saying, ah, it seems like, you know, in populations where there's really high sodium intake, hypertension seems to be a prevalent issue. And for a large percentage of those folks, reducing sodium and or increasing potassium seems to very much help with those hypertension outcomes. So with sodium, it gets complicated because there does seem to be uh, some diversity in terms of genotype where some people are more sensitive to salt than others when it comes to blood pressure and hypertension. So some people will increase their dietary sodium and it really doesn't affect their blood pressure much at all. Uh, some people increase their dietary sodium and their blood pressure goes up and they might have higher risk for hypertension. Uh, and there are even some people who uh, they almost have like an inverse relationship where if they are at their normal level and they drastically minimize their sodium intake, their blood pressure actually goes up, uh, which is which is a bit odd. Um, and, and so I, I, I don't think it's easy to do like a one size fits all recommendation for sodium. And then, of course, I mean, you start talking about athletes who compete in or, or train, train and compete in hot weather. And, you know, they're losing a lot of sodium in their sweat. So their sodium needs are kind of influenced by that. So, again, we're not we're not putting these guidelines on a pedestal and being super dogmatic and saying you need to check every single box regardless of context. But, you know, like I was getting at earlier, I think when it comes to putting together a healthy dietary pattern, we want to just kind of lean on what seems to be the consensus of the best available evidence. Like what things do we have a pretty good handle on currently when we look at long-term cardiometabolic outcomes and mortality outcomes? And when we kind of put these two tables together, we start to get a really nice set of dietary criteria that we can broadly view as compatible with favorable health outcomes. Uh, to what extent you wish to adhere to any particular one of these is totally up to you. Like, I, I'm not here to get in an argument with someone who says, well, I, I like to eat way more than 30% of my calories from fat. That's totally fine. What I would say to that person, and a, a lot of people are in that position, ketogenic diet does have some very sensible applications. Um, but what I would say is, okay, you want to have 70% of your calories coming from fat. That falls short of one of these boxes. Um, but where's that fat coming from? You know, maybe, maybe then you say, okay, but you know, I am limiting added sugar. I am eating plenty of, uh, you know, very fibrous, low starch vegetables so that I'm getting fiber and I'm getting my vegetables every day. Uh, through that, maybe I'm getting plenty of potassium. My fiber is adequate. You know, what, what I would encourage people to do is not say there's one criterion on this list that I hate. Therefore I'm throwing out everything. Yeah. You know, the, the purpose of this, you know, you might say, well, I, I don't really like beans and legumes. Fine. But you, you can still, you know, adhere to or, or strive to meet some of these other uh, quantitative objectives, and it will probably be fairly compatible with some nice health outcomes, you know? So you don't have to, to buy the whole list or sell the whole list, but it is a set of criteria that broadly nudge people towards some pretty, uh, pretty health compatible eating patterns. So Broadly speaking, what we're looking at here when you start to just condense it uh, more qualitatively is plenty of fiber, which broadly speaking seems to be a really solid thing for, for a variety of health outcomes. Um, what I would call a, suit, a suitable intake of both potassium and sodium. Uh, and, and this is one of those things that if you're like, listen, I don't think I'm particularly sensitive to sodium in the diet. I don't want to worry that much about potassium and sodium, you know, either their absolute amounts or their relative amounts compared to one another. For those folks, I'd say at bare minimum, just keep an eye on your blood pressure. You know, yeah. if you start noticing that you're getting into the prehypertension or even hypertension range, of course, I'm not a doctor, you know, so this isn't medical advice. But if I started to see my blood pressure going up, I'd go and chat with a doctor and say, what's going on here? And they might say, hey, why don't you try limiting sodium and see what happens? You know, there, there might be a variety of different routes you can take there. So uh, if you're someone who doesn't want to get really particular about potassium and sodium, I totally get that. I know a lot of natural bodybuilders who they're like, hey, I just noticed that I eat seven grams of sodium per day. Is that bad? And that's kind of high. But I mean, you know, their blood pressure is in a normal range. They're they're not having any adverse cardiometabolic indices uh, that, that can really be observed. 
and they're keeping an eye on those things. And it's like, well, then I don't know. Do what you want to do. Yeah, that that's kind of the boat I'm in. I I'm at uh, pro- yeah, probably like six seven grams of sodium a day. Yeah, but it, like you're like you're describing. Um, the issue I have, if anything, is getting hypotensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and even even when I was up near two eighty, uh, blood pressure was like one ten over seventy, and it's it's lower now, which is unfortunate. Yeah, um, that's crazy. That's really low. Yeah, sometimes stand up and. Ooh, get all woozy but yeah. yeah but yeah so uh but yeah if, if i was if my blood pressure was like 140 over 90 or something um then i certainly would cut back yeah or, or at least you know get with a doctor and say what do you what do you recommend as a first line of action here and i i expect they probably would say let's look at probably sodium if not both sodium and potassium and just try to get those in a in a more more uh comfortable balance based on what your blood pressure is telling you yeah um so yeah the the broad strokes here high fiber a suitable potassium to sodium intake um usually blood pressure is going to help you kind of figure out if that needs to be acted upon plenty of fruits and vegetables um you want to minimize processed meats and charred meats you know you you don't uh eating charred meat that um you know there, there have been some studies saying, yeah, maybe not ideal for gastric cancers. Um, red meat in moderation. You know, I'm certainly not saying that, you know, people should eat zero red meat. But broadly speaking, when you look at the at the literature, it generally tends and it trends in the direction of, of saying eh, maybe in moderation. You know, uh, the, the, the long term health outcome literature, for example, for like fish and poultry seems to be a little bit more favorable than it is for red meat, especially fatty cuts of red meat. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to eat enough protein to support lean body mass, of course, which doesn't necessarily take all that much, as we've talked about previously. Um, a, maintaining a, a reasonably high ratio of polyunsaturated to saturated fatty acids seems to do pretty well in the literature. I know a lot of people uh, have essentially built their entire personality around uh, fighting that recommendation. Like if you were to go out and say, Hey, like polyunsaturated fats, pretty good. Saturated fat might want to limit. Some people will just absolutely lose it when, when that comes up. But I mean, the literature isn't really that hard to parse with those outcomes. It, it looks pretty, pretty straightforward. Like I, I wouldn't say like, yeah, I mean, there, there have been both observational uh, lines of evidence and randomized controlled trials where managing that ratio of polyunsaturated to saturated fatty acid, pr- preferably nudging it toward the higher range, seems to be pretty good for blood lipids and cardiometabolic outcomes. Uh, total fat intake, you know, not too low, not too high. That That's where a lot of the research generally nudges you toward. And then saturated fatty, a- saturated fatty acids, capping those at less than 10% of total energy broadly spe- speaking seems to be pretty compatible with the, with the research um you have something to say i i do just just yeah. one one thing to point out that i find kind of funny um so you you mentioned uh people who who just like really push back against the polyunsaturated to saturated fat uh stuff and also just just people in general who have uh, fringe nutrition ideas that are very much not supported by by the literature. Um, like wh- one thing to note uh, that I, I think most listeners are probably aware of is that a lot of the research in nutrition, um, s- specifically for long for long term health outcomes, comes from either like it, either like observational epidemiological studies or like cohort studies. There aren't you know, there aren't that many like 30, 40 year RCTs where you say, I don't know if there are any, but yeah, like, it's not like there are a ton of studies where you say like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to have one group eat low saturated fat, one group eat high saturated fat for the next 30 years and just observe the outcomes. And like, they're definitely going to stick to that. Um, cause yeah, like that's, that's not how, how humans eat. Um, like people aren't going to want to sign up for a study where researchers are controlling their diet for the next three decades. So, uh, people with, with very heterodox, uh, nutritional ideas will point to the research that does exist and be like, Ooh, you're making the classic blunder. Um, you're drawing causal inferences from observational research, uh, which 
that part in, in a vacuum is, is a fair critique. And then they'll take the next step and say, and in fact, these things that healthy people seem to do, it is actually bad for their health, but because people are telling them they're healthy, like they're doing these things, but also like a lot of other healthy behaviors. And so ultimately you're dealing with, with a case of healthy user bias, um, where it looks like the things I'm promoting are associated with bad health outcomes, looks like the things uh, the World Health Organization, uh, uh, like the EU, similar body, like similar body in the US. Like It seems like all of the things they're promoting are associated with good health outcomes. But you know what? Turns out you can't believe any of that stuff because it's all just observational research. And uh, actually, you should just only live on a diet of raw red meat. Yeah. But the, the thing is, then they'll they'll come back with claims of like, and guess what? Carbs, they'll kill you. Uh, all seed oils and things with uh, high levels of omega-6s, they're poison. They'll kill you. Vegetables, guess what? They'll also kill you. But it's like, I have a hard time <laughs> understanding how you square that with the critique of observational research and healthy user bias. Because the thing is, if those things are so bad you still have to contend with the fact that the folks who do who eat that way still do have generally positive health outcomes like right it, th there there is an upward constraint on how bad and poisonous those things can be you know like, yeah in unless you're contending that like if those people were just eating the way i told them they would live to maybe 150 years old yeah you yeah. know like yeah it, it, it is so someone tried to like drag me into a debate uh, which is always the best way to do it. Uh, just a online debate where two very confident people yell over each other and cannot fact check each other in real time. That's always the best. Uh, so I was like, hey, you should debate this person. And I said, well, we have such um, severe gaps, uh, such a, a mismatch in terms of the way we view epistemology, just what levels of evidence we find to be convincing and compelling. And like, we, we can't even agree on like, broadly speaking, what is the hierarchy of evidence for nutrition and what counts as very credible nutrition evidence. And based on that, there would be no utility of doing a debate. Uh, and, and, and it was, it's kind of like, Hey, let's play this sport. Um, but we, absolutely will not agree upon the rules before the match. Yeah. We'll just go into it. You'll be playing one sport. I'll be playing a fully different version. And we'll just like kind of figure out how it went after the fact. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, there, there's so many instances where you'll see people saying, yeah, I mean, sure. There's all this evidence that, that shows that at bare minimum, all these things are, are really, really compatible with, with great health and, and, and you know, excellent long-term health outcomes. Um, but I want to throw that out because have you seen this in vitro research, you know, or I eat very differently and sure enough, I am right here and alive. So how do you explain that? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's just like, there's just this general rejection of, you know, really high quality epidemiological research and nutrition. Um, it, Re rejection you know well the rcts are too short the the epidemiological stuff is too observational the cohort stuff eh, they didn't really control it that well even though it was uh, uh you know a, a cohort based intervention over several decades so like let's just bring it back to the petri dishes and just assume that i can learn more from a, a mouse with fundamentally different metabolic characteristics than i can from twenty thousand humans who were involved in a a prospective cohort intervention. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to do with that. So like, I I'm certain that there are going to be a lot of folks that, that hear this segment and say, uh, this Trexler guy is an idiot because has he seen this mouse study and ignored all the relevant human evidence? And yeah, there's some of these battles that just really can't be won in the short term. And, uh, it is what it is. But, uh, now that we've discussed some of these broad strokes, um, kind of basic eating patterns and, and kind of guidelines that seem to be 
most compatible with the current evidence, inevitably people are going to say, yeah, but give me a diet. Give me a named diet that works and is better than the rest. I don't want to do that, but I will say there there are multiple named diets that generally check off uh, plenty of these boxes, right? So a couple that come to mind, this isn't the whole list, but two that come to mind, I think the DASH diet tends to be a pretty sensible diet. I think if you don't have hypertension, there might be some constraints in there that are not fully applicable to you. Um, so I'm not saying it's the perfect diet for all people, but the DASH diet tends to do pretty well. Uh, the Mediterranean diet tends to do pretty well. I know a lot of people then come in and argue very aggressively about what the Mediterranean diet truly is. Um, I'm just going off of the intervention studies and the set of characteristics that have broadly been embraced in the literature to this point. Uh, so, for example, uh, stuff you eat on the Mediterranean diet, plenty of whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, healthy fats, herbs, and spices. I read that quote from uh, an image here before people just absolutely tear me apart for using the term healthy fats. But broadly speaking, they're talking about fats that have a lot of unsaturated fatty acids and relatively low saturated fatty acid content. Uh, the stuff that is, you know, still pretty heavily emphasized, but not quite as much as the others. We've got fish, other seafood and, and foods that are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, uh, poultry, eggs, and dairy, still part of the diet, but not, not quite as, as highly emphasized. And then things that you would eat sparingly would be things like red meats and, you know, sweets with a lot of added sugar. When we look at the DASH diet, again, plenty of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, uh, low, low-ish fat dairy products, fish, poultry, beans, nuts, seeds, vegetable oil, stuff like that. Things that you would limit on a DASH diet or, or that kind of eating pattern would be fatty meats, uh, full fat dairy, sugar sweetened beverages, sweets, and, you know, really high added sodium intake. Um, you know, people, again, are going to go nuts and say, well, there, here's this study on full fat dairy that says it's fine. I'm not saying that these eating patterns are, I'm not saying that every guideline in here is fully necessary for every single individual, um, but these are a couple dietary patterns that broadly speaking are pretty compatible with those broad guidelines from the two, uh, the two healthy diet indicator sets of criteria that I mentioned previously. Yeah, ju just saying like if if you're very insistent about having a named diet. Yeah, these these seem to be pretty good. Yeah, they seem to be pretty good, but most importantly, the the, the key point here is that these are not the only two options. There are plenty of cuisines around the world that are very much compatible with these broad sets of eating patterns and eating behavior. So like I know one thing a lot of people say is that some of these um some of these named diets often tend to be used in a way that kind of excludes major portions of the world. You know, th th it just kind of recommends like particular food items and like, you know, sometimes you'll see like, here's a sample meal pattern and you'll find that it is, it's very, um, it, it's not very compat compatible with different cuisines around the world uh, and, and just, you know, different, um, you know, spices and food sources, you know, they, they tend to get very regionalized and say, okay, everyone in the world, ignore your cultural traditions and eat just this set of foods, right? Um, and that's not necessary. There's plenty of cuisines around the entire world that could be uh, fully compatible with these types of, of, of eating patterns uh, with, you know, just little modifications and, and little um, bits of effort here and there to incorporate certain food items. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying, you know, everyone has to eat these two named diets. These are two that come to mind that are pretty well studied, that check a lot of the boxes. But, I mean, I, I've been eating a lot of different... Uh, you know, as I've kind of transitioned into a more plant-based eating pattern, I've been eating a lot more Asian cuisines. I've been eating a lot of Chinese food, Thai food, Vietnamese food, Indian food. Um, and yeah, man, it's great. But, but it is kind of, kind of eye-opening. I used to, I used to eat essentially just shredded chicken for every meal and like just nor, yeah, just eating like kind of the, the very generic sets of vegetables that come in the American supermarket. And to me, I'm like eating all these foods. I'm like, I've never heard of this in my life, but but they still broadly allow you to check a lot of these boxes, you know? Yeah. You, you seem to be very tickled and I don't know why. No, d two things. One, just you, you, your your mention of uh, 
eating a, a broader variety of foods. One of my favorite Eric interactions of all time was uh, one time when, when you came over to work and you just had this gleam in your eye. You said, Greg, have you heard about cumin? <laughs> that was that was one of one of the better starts to a work day I've ever had. I, ca I came in like I um, was like a music insider with my ear to the ground. It was like, dude, something just dropped. Yeah. Like cumin is out. <laughs> and and it, have you heard of this? Did you know it was coming? Like, yeah. It'd be like if somebody dropped a new album and I was the first person that heard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that that was uh th that was my first my first thought. The first thing I found a little amusing. Second thing, uh mentioning that you've been eating eating more uh Asian cuisine, uh more like Chinese food, more Indian food, etc. Uh this is this is um slightly tangential to health. Not exactly what you're talking about, but since we're since this is somewhat a segment about uh, uh, difficult to defend health claims that people make online, uh, one of the one of the ones that just it, at its most basic level I find uh, quite quite humorous um, is people claiming that like vegetarian and vegan diets, uh, and particularly diets high in soy and low in uh, animal products, animal fats are just like catastrophically bad for reproductive function because <laughs> like look look when, when look you, at the scoreboard yeah exactly exactly <laughs> if if you just if you just pull up a list of of where are there a lot of people where does it appear that people have been really successfully procreating and what do they eat yeah um you know I think that uh, that is observational evidence. If someone <laughs> wants to throw that back at me, I'll take it on the chin. But but like, come on. But again, the, the come on. The claim that you're making is this eating pattern tanks fertility. Like, right. Yeah. Ob it doesn't take that much <laughs> observational research to at ver at the very least nullify that claim. Correct. Like, yeah. If you're telling me this dietary pattern is incompatible with fertility, <laughs> it. I don't have to clear a high bar <laughs> to, to disprove that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so wrapping things up here. Uh, and the reason I bring up the different cuisines, though, is I know there's been a movement within the, uh, the dietetics profession to just be a little bit more culturally inclusive, mm -hmm. because what they kind of observed, like in American dietetics, is that everyone was coming in and a, a lot of diet. And I'm, this isn't a knock on dietitians because they identified that this was a practice that needed updating. But people were coming in from all different cultural backgrounds with all different cooking experiences and cuisines. And everyone was just being sent home with like, have you tried white potatoes, broccoli and chicken breast? And they're like, I don't eat this shit. Yeah. <laughs> like this is not I've never known people that eat this. like this is not how I eat. Like, can you meet me? Not halfway. Can you meet me an eighth of the way in the middle here? And, and so, like, it is important to kind of just acknowledge that very, very different cultural traditions and, and cuisines and things like that, they can all be incorporated in a way that that meets some of these broad criteria. Yeah. Um, you know, people will... <laughs> I can already see comments coming in. Thank God, as we've covered in previous episodes, I don't read them. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, ah, but what about seed oils being catastrophic? That's an unsupported claim. It, it just is. Uh, what about gluten causing all sorts of problems for people who don't have celiac disease or sensitivity, if broadly speaking, to like high FODMAP foods? Again, it's it's an unsupported kind of line of inquiry that people have taken, mostly to sell books. Uh, what about carbs being the root of all cardiometabolic problems? They're just not. Um, it, it's not hard to disprove that in a pretty convincing way. Uh well, Eric, you don't talk about biohacking and fasts and things like that. There's a reason for that because it's unsupported. Uh, we're we're just looking at the distilling from decades and decades of nutritional science. What are the things we feel like we can really hang our hat on here? Um, what about uh, plants being poisonous? Not going to entertain it. It, it. It's a silly idea. Uh, if you really want to make the claim that eating vegetables is a potently deleterious act, you have no value for 
research. And, and therefore, like that conversation is a non-starter because I'm going to lean on the research of actual health outcomes in humans. And if you really think that eating vegetables is a severe hazard to human health, I, I truly don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Uh, and again, the, the idea that, for example, all animal-based protein being unhealthy, that also is an unsupported thing. And I, I, I'm saying that as, as a vegan, you know, like I, I'm trying to play it just by the book here, looking at the literature. I don't currently eat any animal-based proteins, but I don't have to go around and say, well, actually they're absolutely catastrophic to your health just to make myself feel better. Um, you know, like I said, there is some evidence to say, yeah, it might be worthwhile to limit certainly processed meats. And then, you know, maybe also like fatty red meat in moderation. Right. But the, the literature pertaining to poultry and fish is excellent, you know, and, and I don't have to justify my own biases by making untrue, unsupported health claims, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, just be careful out there, folks. There's a lot of stuff in nutrition, a lot of different dietary kind of pockets out there of really uh really enthusiastic proponents who want you for some reason to throw out decades and decades and decades of incremental scientific progress and i would at the at the bare minimum just encourage you to resist that urge to uh like i said that that example with the maze maybe hesitate before saying yeah let me take me back to the start and i'll just try a totally different path and forget everything I learned along the way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, do we know everything with nutritional science? Of course not. You know, we, we don't have enough. We, we don't have a fully complete picture. We cannot draw up this and say this is the optimal single human diet. Like I've said previously, I don't think that even exists. I, I think that's a bit of a fool's errand. Um, but the stuff isn't that complicated to the extent that you, that you should say, well, is it possible that we truly don't know a single thing about human nutrition? Uh, so people will try to overcomplicate and, you know, misattribute blame to certain nutritional components. They're largely doing that to just open up a little space, uh, a space kind of create a niche for whatever angle they're trying to take. Um, but what I would encourage people to do is just focus on broad eating patterns. Try not to focus on demonizing individual nutrients or individual food sources. And when we look at the broad eating patterns that are compatible uh, with, you know, supporting health, longevity, et cetera, we are starting to work our way toward a nice, uh, concise little list of, of patterns and behaviors that seem to be very compatible with a healthy diet. Yeah. One, one thing I guess that I would add is I, so I have... Um, I have nothing but disdain for most of the people who uh, who, who put forth and promote uh, a, a lot of these pr pretty uh, pretty unjustifiable um, pr perspectives on nutrition. But I, I will say that that I and, and I assume both of us have uh, quite a bit of of empathy and understanding for people who would get sucked in by a lot of that. Yeah. Um, I think that there's, you know, I think it, it makes sense to look around and say, uh, especially in, in America, uh, which is where around half of our audience is located. And I mean, a, a pretty disproportionate chunk of the most out there nutrition folks are, are American. And I, I, uh, I, I think there's probably a reason for that. But I, I think it's it's easy to look around and say, well, you know, there's science seems to have improved our lives in so many ways and like advanced so much like, you know, people aren't dying from communicable diseases at, at nearly the rates they were a long time ago. Um, uh, like a lot of, of medication has improved, like treatment of heart disease, uh, has gotten way, way better. Like that kills way fewer people than it used to. Um, cancer treatment seems to be improving on the tech side of things, you know, compare computers today to computers 30 years ago. seems like there's so much progress being made. Um, but it, it seems like in spite of a lot of 
external markers of progress, um, just the general health of a lot of people uh, s- seems to be kind of trending down. Or, yeah, I mean, like, you you look around and there's there's a lot of, of very unhealthy people out there. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to comport particularly well with the advances we've seen in, in other things. And I think it's easy to look at that and then look at, um, you know, some of the, some of the worst excesses of the industrialization of food production, uh, all of like the, the hyper palatable, hyper processed foods on the shelves, um, and just kind of kind of find yourself in a position where it feels like uh it feels like something is just is just wrong with with food like there it, there has to be something amiss for us to find ourselves in the position we're in um you know g- given the the broader uh progress we're seeing in in basically all other domains so like what what's going on there and so I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of that is like very multifactorial. Um, but I, I think that like single factor thinking is very seductive because it, it can give you it can give you a sense of control and it can give you a feeling that, hey, if I can just like control and manage this one thing, like I can I can take control of my life, get everything back on track um like it's it's an it's a easier narrative than trying to look at like all of the different underlying causes of things going on and the solution also presents itself as being easier than you know like hey let let's completely redesign american cities so that you can walk and cycle more and be more active and you know maybe be a little healthier for for that reason like let's uh try to transition away from fossil fuels so air quality is better so i if you have asthma you can go outside without hacking up a lung like you know like the the like big structural problems are more challenging to tackle and i <laughs> i think that by and large like the american political system has has proven itself to have little appetite for tackling a lot of those things and so um I don't know, the, like all of it can just make you feel like you're you're going crazy and just lose, losing control of your life. And uh, when you find yourself in a situation like that, a silver bullet type solution that at least like purports to have really vast and powerful explanatory power starts being very appealing and seductive. Um, and so like I I absolutely understand how consumers of that information kind of get sucked down those rabbit holes and and find it uh convincing or or at least alluring and enticing yeah. um so i i have a, a ton a ton of empathy for for folks who who find themselves in those content spaces but um yeah i i just encourage you to uh i don't know just just take a step back and, and look at things a little bit more critically yeah, I know. I, I totally echo that. Uh, I think it's very understandable to be in a position where you're ready to embrace some of those ideas. And uh, I think it's really easy nowadays to be exposed to those ideas in a way that's very, very convincing and compelling, um, which I, I understand, but also just generally view to be unfortunate, you mm-hmm. know. But um, yeah, I I, I, I certainly don't fault anyone for getting drawn into some of those narratives. Um, and like one of the things that always comes up along those lines, like you're kind of getting at this with what you're saying, but like I've seen so many people on the internet who it's like they have embraced uh, a pretty compa- compelling sales pitch for some very heterodox, like very fringe nutrition idea. And their response to it is, you know, if you say, well, like, look at these guidelines that are pretty broadly embraced by like every major health focused organization across the world. It's not like one government is just kind of setting the rules here. You know, if you bring up that kind of argument, a lot of times it'll be like, 
oh yeah great that goes into the dietary guidelines and look look how far they've gotten us like yeah. like the u.s government dietary guidelines yes and, and to that i will also i will often say who do you know who doesn't i'm not i'm not talking about adherence who do you know who can currently state the government dietary guidelines almost no one in the general population even knows what they are yeah. Aside from just general vibes, which is vegetables are nice uh, and don't eat as many desserts. Like that's pretty much the extent to which the, the general population knows the U.S. dietary guidelines. And then ask yourself, of the people who know them, who applies them, right? And so like the idea that you can say, well, here's the guidelines, here's the population level outcomes, looks like the guidelines aren't working. I mean, that doesn't, it kind of implies or assumes that people are actually following those guidelines and all of the empirical evidence would tell us that they're not correct you know yeah. so that feeds into a lot of that conspiratorial thinking of like you had your chance to set the guidelines and look how far it's gotten us well the act of setting a nutritional guideline is not really the helpful part it, it's the adherence to a set of dietary habits and behaviors and you can make the argument that perhaps maybe there would be some utility in reframing these various eating patterns in a way that would make adherence more likely. I think that's a very strong case you could make. But the idea that because obesity rates are high or, you know, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, whatever outcome you want to focus on, because those are high, necessarily the guidelines are flawed. That, that if you just interrogate that argument in and of itself, it doesn't hold up. It, it, it fully breaks down. Um, so yeah, I, I echo your sentiment. Like I, I think it's unfortunate that folks are making these very superficial arguments that draw people in. I, I think it's unfortunate that some of those arguments on the surface level do, do seem to be quite compelling. And ultimately I have a lot of empathy for people who are being led down a road that is ultimately somewhat deleterious to their health. Um, and without really knowing it or, or signing up for that, you know? Yeah. And then one other thing I just want to reiterate, there's going to be folks who are like, hey, my dietary pattern that I prefer doesn't really uh, mix well with with all of these criteria. That's completely fine. Like I, I have no, like, no interest at all in trying to dictate how people eat. Um, I just try to put out information that seems most compatible with the evidence. Like there's going to be people who are, really healthy who say, Eric, I'm on a ketogenic diet and I'm, you know, deviating from several of these items, but I love the way I eat. And all of my metrics right now would indicate that I'm in good health. If you expect me to be upset about that, you fundamentally misunderstand my incentives. I don't want people <laughs> to be in poor health. So if you're in great health and not adhering to all these guidelines, I am genuinely happy for you. Uh, but the purpose of guidelines is to say, okay, if we put 30 million people <laughs> on a diet and we had to kind of give them some check, some boxes that they should strive toward checking, these are the broad brush strokes, you know, the, the general guidelines that they ought to be aiming for based on the evidence. That does not preclude in any way the possibility that there are people who deviate from these regularly and are experiencing really good health at the moment. So um, that, that's not the intention. I know a lot of smart folks who are on, you know, ketogenic diets that don't check all of these boxes, but are still really well-formulated diets. You know, like uh, I think a lot of people assume that if you're on a ketogenic diet, you basically just eat like uh, Philly cheese sandwiches without the bread all day. And that's like all you eat, right? Uh, just beef and cheese and, and, and that's it. Um, I know a lot of folks who are, you know, on ketogenic diets, they eat a lot of fibrous vegetables. They have some nuts and seeds in the mix. Like they actually do check more of these boxes than you might think. So, so I don't want this to be the type of thing that, uh, becomes like a diet wars. Like I don't want to put gasoline on that flame and fuel more of it. Um, but what I would encourage people to do is if you have a dietary pattern that you really like, but perhaps you are unsatisfied with your current health status, or you have some concerns about, um, you know, your current diet's compatibility with some of these guidelines, you don't necessarily have to overhaul every behavior in your life and immediately start from scratch. 
you might just consider saying, okay, I'm going to work toward getting a couple of these uh, additional guidelines met within the broad uh, eating pattern that I currently have. Okay, so the purpose here is to be helpful uh, and to lead people toward evidence-based guidelines, not to disparage any particular dietary strategy or to make people uh, angry because their preferred method of dieting doesn't, you know, check every box.